Welcome everyone. This is our second event in the Baobab Black Art Series and it's also being uh, run in conjunction with the Justice Sessions and we're in our third month of the bi-weekly Justice Sessions. Today we're focusing on poetry with this Creative Writers Forum and we're pleased to have two outstanding local poets here for a reading and discussion of this art. Before they're introduced, I will introduce today's host, Mark Ari. Mark Ari is an assistant professor of creative writing and is editorial advisor and creative nonfiction editor for Flock Literary Journal. He is editor and producer of Eat, a publisher of audio chapbooks, including the highly regarded Eat Poems series. He publishes fiction, creative nonfiction, poetry, and music journalism. His novel, The Shoemaker's Tale, received high praise in the New York Times, Kirkus Reviews, the Jerusalem Post, and other international trade and popular periodicals. He is a performing singer-songwriter. He exhibits his paintings and installations in group and solo shows internationally. Most recently, he collaborated on Not In My Country, a multimedia installation included in Something's Gotta Give a month-long exhibition at West Beth Gallery in New York City. Ari is a McDowell Fellow. He has also been awarded fellowships by Ragsdale Foundation, Fundacion Valparaiso, Ucross Foundation, and Hermitage Artists Retreat. So thank you so much for being here and joining us for our Poetry Day. And um, thank you, Ari, for being our host. Thanks, Drew. Uh... I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this combination of the Justice Sessions, the Baobab Black Artist Series and Creative Writings Word by Word Reading Series. I wanna thank Keith Cartwright, Laura Heffernan, and of course, True Leverett for making it possible to bring you these two remarkable poets today, Yvette Angelique and Liz Strait. I'll introduce Yvette first and after she reads for you, I'll introduce Liz. And when Liz has finished her set, uh, we'll take questions. Uh, you can type your questions in Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start us off with one of my own while you're typing and, and then I'll read yours. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, Yvette Angelique is an award-winning poet, teaching artist, and proven culture change strategist. She is author of the poetry chapbooks, Shut Eyes See and Intimate Moments. Her poems appear in Bucks County Journal and Sonia Sanchez's mural arts anthology, Peace is a Haiku Song. Yvette's essays, books, chapter, book chapters, and articles are available in various publications and contribute to the discourse of personal and social change. Her audio chapbook, Something Old, New, Borrowed, and the Blues, was released by Eat Poems in September 2020. Okay, so that's the official bio, and uh, Yvette is all of those things and something remarkably more. She is a great spirit. You feel it in her presence. She knows how to confront injustice, and how to embrace life. If there are people who heal just by their presence in the world, Yvette is one of them. She is incomparable. It is my great pleasure to introduce Yvette Angelique. Wow, thank you, Ari. All right, thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Y'all gotta keep me on time, I'm looking at myself. Uh, I have a, a, a couple of poems and I actually have a piece that's in process. I think as a poet, it's always great to read something that's really kind of raggedy that's coming out. So things don't always feel like it's like pristine coming out of the box because that's not real as a writer and poet. So uh, I'm going to be reading a piece that's on the EP, uh, Something Old, New, Borrowed in the Blues. And it's, uh, it's an Aris Poetica. After God troubles the water, Luna shines her light on feet wading creeks. Journey after journey, shackle throat, wrist and spirit escape into the wind. These are my people, chocolate cherry, milky mulatto ancestors. Let the stories live as family, they say. Decade after decade, truth beats as love and triumph. Sister after sister, we wear shield and savior as mask. Black Jesus, do you even hear my prayers? 
I finger triggered traumas as diminished chords, dark, dissonant. Do they too belong in the melody of all of us? Burke Backrack's greatest hits, they were my happy chords to play on a tabletop organ, healing my cries from injustice. When grandmother's loses her only son, murdered by his boss before going postal became a thing for hazard pay. Heartbeats disturb my sense of paradise. Mama still seeks, knocking on doors like Moses, preaching before the Red Sea, drown feelings I cannot speak, but strum on a Les Paul guitar, blow into a maple burl flute, give birth to this poem that lives every day, uncensored in a history only my gut can see. I'm going to read a piece that um, is an upcoming introduction to um, a book that I'm writing. And the book um, is, the working title is called uh, Black Joy Lives in the Revolution. And this will be the opening piece once I, once I get its act together. In spite of the revolution, black joy always lived in us. Give me some sugar, baby. It wasn't creepy, but kind to show black children somebody loved them. A jelly glass of Kool-Aid, a bologna sandwich, some potato sticks, orange slices. This was a meal for any kid on the block who ran with us down the alley. One, two, three, red light or rolling down Miss Roberta's backyard. Can her eat with us? Mama corrected our hers and she's. And yes, there was enough food for everybody's baby. And there was always joy in our intimacy. When a black man cupped his woman's hand, walked beside her, called her queen, opened doors and gates, Thick and tall, short and lean, a brother's facial hair would be carved meticulously, and he smelled like musk. He was our art, our Charlemagne's Moorish chief, and we sisters welcomed his protection. He was our guardian of the Seraglio. Only our 1970s man was draped in the Dinkra symbols, made as cotton daishiki, and he stepped and dragged his toes in Stacy Adams' Oxfords. And there was always joy in our compassion. Daddy's grandpas and uncles became the jungle gems for us kids. If one of us failed and hurt ourselves and the other kids laughed at us, daddy's grandpas and uncles were right there dried our tears, tickled us saying, get on back in there, show your toughness. We needed to be taught tough. We didn't even know. We couldn't see the layers of lessons bricking our backbone for marches, sit-ins, hosings, and spit-ats. We'd be freeing in our afros and brown fists in the air knowing black joy was in the revolution will not be televised. Gil Scott Heron sang to us over W-O-L-A-M in the morning. And Petey Green whispered to all of us, we are Chocolate City. And we felt a sense of pride as our eyes shut down to sleep. And there was always joy in our creativity. Black joy is writing a poem. Hearing a song rattle inside the radiator, the smell of Sunday, and my grandma flows fried chicken, flowered wings, easing in between her twisted fingers, she called Arthur. She laid that hen in hot bacon grease and a heavy yellow frying pan, 
balled up her free hand with bare aspirin. She popped and snapped like Tic Tacs. We could hardly wait to be toothpicking out our smiles, that potato salad, green beans, and fried chicken, making room for that two-finger pound cake and a stovetop percolated Maxwell House coffee. Black Joy always lived in the stories told on 34th and Clay Street, blocks from the Anacostia River, moments from sit-ins at the G Street Woolworths, riots burning stores on H Street, Vietnam protests in front of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And on the steps of Lincoln's memorial, we could hear waves of echoes, roars and cheers, as if in a call and response to a booming voice. I have a dream today. And I think I have time for one short one that's in a poetic form that's called a triolet. It's called Unk's Ride. Rear view mirror, remember the show? Three girls rocking Diana's dreams. With big pin mites jamming in the backseat row. Slanted rear mirror, remember the show? Can't hurry, love, we get down low. Neck be bopping, egg and hollers and screams. Rear view mirror, remember the show? Three girls rocking Diana Supremes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna, I want to applaud for everybody, but, uh, uh, but that was fabulous. Thank you, Yvette. Thank you. I'm going to uh, uh, introduce Liz now. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, Yvette. <laughs> Thank you. Liz Strait has been on the spoken word scene internationally for over 20 years. This native of the Mississippi Gulf Coast has held rank as one of the United States' top spoken word artists. Liz received her AA degree in mass communications right here at the University of North Florida. She soon left Jacksonville and exploded on the spoken word scene, becoming an internationally renowned slam champion, broadcast radio personality, and prison activist. Partly raised in the no-holds-barred streets of South Philadelphia, the way Liz steps to the mic is gritty and in your face, so be prepared for some strong language. <laughs> but, but her work is also literary, poised, and graceful. I've known Liz since she stepped into one of my creative writing classes a fistful of years ago. She was astonishing then. She has been astonishing ever since at every turn. Absolutely spectacular. I'm honored to introduce Liz Strait. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. And I think I have um, a good amount of poetry for my set. I hope that um, you all enjoy it. And if you don't, that is fine too. <laughs> So I realized in uh, preparing for this that a lot of my poems are written from the perspective of me like feeling like I was under the weight of something and being overly aware of the world around me, the people in my world, and feeling very anxious about it. And so in, in, in looking at that aspect of my poetry, I have discovered how powerful it is to reclaim my awareness so that it's not a source of anxiety, so that it is a source of inspiration. So the first poem I'm sharing is called uh, See What Had Happened Was, and uh, there's some fact and some fiction here, kind of like when you hear someone start a story with that phrase, you might know it's gonna be a little bit maybe unbelievable 50% of, of the time. So. Here we go. The night I was conceived, she never came. Some loon smeared shit on a wall in an asylum somewhere. Prints open for Rick James. Chicken slept just outside of the window my mother snuck out of, where I would soon be sleeping. A rabbit's nose twitched in its hole. A dry foot was sent back to Haiti. A pair of work boots tracked mud through a just clean kitchen. 
there were many moments of silence taken. My grandma cussed somebody out for something, I'm sure. The earth shook. Ted Turner prayed that 24 hours a day was a good enough pace to outrun his father's ghost. Almost fertilized egg me prepared to be a forever excuse. The first boy to find out that my DNA had aligned to make my left breast a little bit smaller than my right was telling his mother about his first day in the second grade. A seasoned woman laughed with a young man probably the age her son would be if she'd known what to do with him. McDonald's closed at nine. A boa constrictor tried eating an alligator. Steve, Stevie Wonder was on Johnny Carson. My dad removed the patch from his letterman's jacket and gave it to my mama under the bleachers in a different Mississippi town. Tar melted the skin off a black woman's back. Her girlfriend watched from across the parking lot, vomiting from the smell. Clouds covered the moon. No storms were reported. No tears fell. No prayers were answered. This next poem is called Heavy. My questions ache with deliberate angst. I am unsure, yet I am whole. The breaths, they come one after another. And with them, I fill the spaces between the lines. The perimeter of this life is easily assembled. The problem is the middle pieces that all look alike. The gift that rests in my chest is a sedimentary stone. I thank God I was born with this hammer tongue. <clears throat> okay, this next poem is one of my favorites. Um, it's called the Nutsack Poem. So I'm glad you warned people about the strong language. <laughs> I hope my mom isn't watching. Okay, <clears throat> the Nutsack Poem. Dawn breaks. I roll over in the dewy newness of the morning. He follows behind. Then, like an obscenity of nature, his sack, sweaty and sticky like a tree frog, flops onto my voluptuous thigh, interrupting the waterfall of poetry flowing effortlessly through my mind and I am repulsively reminded of the infamous six-legged creature that still backstrokes in the soup bowl of my nightmares the toad that mother found in the laundry after the dryer cycle stopped, the bonfire surprise that turned out to be possum stew, the very large pig head discovered in my in-law's refrigerator during my first visit. And how could I forget the get this roach off me dance that would have put those river dancing geeks to shame? All of these things, incidents that have shaken my reality, if just for a moment, and in this moment, disgusted with his wet, warm, loose sack of skin, filled with one half of children we will never have. My reality is once again rocked off of its foundation and I am sure that I am leaving this time for good. Um, this next poem is uh, called Origami and I like to preface it a, a little bit it is about um, my son who was born in 2004. It was a preterm labor, so he only lived for two hours. And that was a very low time for me. And somewhere in that very low time, I wrote this poem. And it's odd to, to have a poem that's so personal to me, but that I literally don't remember uh, writing. So I just wanted to uh, preface that and I hope you enjoy. It's called Origami. You know, one of the women told me, why don't you take up a hobby like origami? Because when you fold the shapes, it's like they take on spirits and you can name them. And all I could think about was where do the spirits of dead babies go? Probably to the same place that their mothers keep trying to find by folding themselves inside of themselves as their stability wears down to paper thin right corner down, left corner down, right side over left side, bottom, up, top, down, right corner down, left corner down, right side over left side until it becomes impossible 
to make your world any smaller. And it is then when people begin noticing your suffering. And how dare you burden others with all of your emotional dribble that's just like a woman. How dare you put a damper on their water cooler conversations that's just like a woman. How dare you let your reality show during their uneventful weekday nights at home watching reality shows. How dare you interrupt glances into their children's eyes because well, you know, God forbid you mention it. God forbid you replay the images of your gut-wrenching sadness over and over again. Finding yourself day nightmaring, but that's not even a word. Daydreaming is so much farther from absurd, but that's usually the case that there are no words in existence to describe how it feels to be living and dying in chorus, in synchronization. But at least you're doing something right. Because when that gentleman on the street thinks that he's so polite when he says, hey, baby girl, why you look so sad? A pretty lady like you would look so much better smiling. You better turn up the corners of your mouth and be quick to dismiss the thought of responding with, motherfucker, you could never know this sorrow that I carry around with me. Maternity clothes riddled with moth holes, womb, empty, arms, empty, demons tempting to invade me and persuade me to lock the door, run the water, and pray that suicide is not the only unforgivable sin. Oh, God, I just want to go there. Get there, be there, stay there, where no one can bother me or slobber on me with their words of encouragement or vomit on me with their so-called understanding or stab me through the heart with condescending gazes or suggest a replacement for the motherhood I was planning. They try and turn my pages and rush me out of this grieving chapter of my life and force me into the light when I know that my third eye's sight is not developed enough to bask in the brightness of yesterday's transformation into today because I keep seeing visions of tiny fingers and toes in my head. No sugar plums here, no sugar coating this. And no, this is not the remix. It's the raw uncut version. It's the song you don't hear on the radio. It's the B side. It's the truth that even a few good men couldn't handle. It's the scandal whispered throughout wooden church pews by gaudy hat wearing gossips confused about their own Christian bullshit. Do unto your neighbor as you would have him do unto your hypocritical ass. That's why I put in this poem whenever the collection plate is passed. Because I want the amalgamation of this congregation to hear me scream out loud. But in my support group, they tell us to practice screaming without making a sound. In a room full of white people who could not fathom the nothingness left. When another black man is forced to take his last breath, even if he was just two hours old, I still began to fold right corner down, left corner down, right side over left side. Okay. So um, this next poem is a high boon. And um, one of my dear friends in the spoken word community uh, named Adam Henze introduced me to this form. It's a literary form originating in Japan that combines a prose and haiku. And usually they're like in diary form or essay form or prose form or travel journal form. So this particular high boon is called Live Poet. And it is um, comprised of a section of prose, then a haiku, another section of prose, and another haiku, and another section of prose, and then another haiku. And it's kind of like in travel journal form, even though I didn't go nowhere but my couch, my living room. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Saturday, April 2nd. I wanted it back. The poet life. Before uterus turned rocket ship, shot putting me onto a planet where all the in two other inhabitants do is ask me for shit. Beg time to consider me worthy of its slow ride. Wish I could set out to find an old familiar, a vibrant locale with hip people that didn't identify as hipsters per se, and where there would be coffee, lots and lots of coffee and alcohol, lots and lots of alcohol. When child wakes, it becomes evident that this is not your life to live. Sunday, April 3rd, 3 a.m. pulled my card. I am not a 20-something shit shoveler anymore. How does one tell their four-year-old, mommy was up writing a poem till 3 a.m., so fuck your breakfast right now, okay? Or more importantly, how does the pee make it from my bladder to porcelain bowl without me getting out of the bed? This sporadic inspiration needs to figure out whose side it's really on. Mommy, wife, nine to five or me, 
or the poet, warrior, gangster, goddess me. One's gonna have to die a slow, painful death. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to give a writer peace. Monday, April 4th. I failed at setting my bedtime for a decent hour again. Husband and child are asleep. It's after midnight, the dishes are washed, and I am writing. Nothing can stop me. This feels so devious. I put vodka in my ginger tea. Take that real job. In your face, 36th birthday next month. Being a rebel in bed wearing blue fuzzy socks feels just as good as the inside of a smoky bar, drinking Grand Marnier straight, waiting for the open mic host to conjure me from a backless bar stool. No extension cord needed for my heating pad in this venue. When four walls close in close enough, a space can be made holy. I close my eyes. My couch almost feels as high off the ground as a stage. Air ducts must need cleaning. Otherwise, why am I struggling to breathe? All right, last poem is called Timber. And this poem uh, is gonna take me right to 15 minutes. So short introduction. Timber, like when a lumberjack yells timber, when the tree's falling. So this is kind of like my, my way of um, celebrating the layers that are in place when, um, you know, like when the writer is born, like there's so many things that, that we um, identify as. And then uh, many times we put the, the writer identity last um, so this is my ode to um, sacrifice to female poets everywhere and just to the journey of, of the black woman and uh, the spoken word. We are wordsmiths. Pulling shooting stars from blackness we do not own, placing them upon our overworked tongues, we spit truth, you see. Grant wishes to freedom-seeking souls, filling their holes, whether they be from bullets or a prolonged belief in bullshit. See, women like we are a rarity. Things get rough for socially degraded deities, still be diamonds nonetheless. And granting lyrical liberation may be the only value we have left. And so many have left this world too soon, headed for the next. Lavender wrapped with daggers strapped to their backs because even in death the fight ain't over. Forget what Christianity told us. Ain't no gender requirements for soldiers. We are wondrous warrior women expected to die these humble deaths drowned in wine left with the stench of pity on our breath. Husband to our right, children to our left, tomb to a spirit long before body was laid to rest. Reality, reality silenced the tempest of these sequoia trees of femininity with poems suffocating behind their lips. Blue now, unable to whisper. I wanted to kiss her, but they say death is contagious. Said goodbye to their good fights, for they live tougher than God made us filled their mouths with hematite, place hands over ears to block the sound of settling for, less waiting to be blessed with more on the way to meet Jehovah, had a feeling he'd screw us over. So purposefully we journeyed toward the wayward way of words. At first, just wanting to be heard, but tongues get tattered over time and sorrow sulks between thighs and so many enemies it would please if we believed that it had to be this way. Like there's no Shiro pose for dying. Even a whore gives up her strut one day when ain't nobody buying. But instead we choose to bend the rules and wipe the dirt up off our knees, swallowing atrocities, prophesizing poetries, turning tricks through limericks laced with rhyme scheme or lack thereof. We are willingly taken advantage of. So use us till you use us up. Lay us down. Get a peace. If it will bring our people peace, we silence insanity just to get by. Too many internal flames to fight. Can't keep paying for melted mics. So we pour libations, chant our pain, reproduce the root of truth, sacrifice ourselves to save you. And it is only after the cutting down that you can truly be amazed by our majesty. So masterfully we write. That's it. That Thank was you. spectacular. Thank you. That was just spectacular. Did I lie? <laughs> I said we had some spectacular people here for you today. Uh, uh, so what I'm going to ask folks to do is uh, if you go to Q&A at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can type in your questions. 
I, I'm going to start with one. Um, uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to throw it open to whoever or, or both, uh, whoever wants to answer. Uh, we are living in these very strange and, uh, and in some ways very troubling times. We have a pandemic. Uh, and at the same time, we have an uprising for racial justice across the, uh, across the country. Uh, so I'd like to know how uh, either or both of these uh, have impacted your work. I can go, Ari. Um, for me, it, it really sent me into a space of radical self-care. And, um, you know, a lot of folk, <clears throat> uh, especially Black folk, who have been on a, uh, a journey of civil rights journey for so long, uh, have been in the streets, have, have been protesting. Um, you know, when I read my poem, you know, I'm from Washington, D.C., so sitting at the nation's capital and, and working in places like the Department of State, I'll walk by, you know, protest and burning fires or whatever. It was just a part of how I grew up, so all of this time is not new. And so for me as an artist, it was a time to be still. It was a time to just <clears throat> be quiet, to turn off the noise. I made it a practice to um, journal every day. I didn't see this as an opportunity. Oh, I got some free time, let me go write. Cause all my gigs and work got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> but if anything, <laughs> but if anything, I was like, this is this is the time for radical self care. And what really affirmed me was that I was reading this article in Yes magazine. It was Angela Davis and her sister having a conversation. And one of the things Angela Davis was saying was like, you know, the one thing we didn't do real well, we didn't take care of ourselves. We did not do self care in the revolution. And one of the things that she's come at this point in her life is to understand is that self-care in the revolution is really an important aspect that is part of the revolution. And so for me, that was affirming because instinctively that was what I needed to do in order to take care of myself so I could go out and continue to rise up, uplift, and do the justice work that I have been doing for the last 30 years. I appreciate your answer to that because the effect that being uh, forced to be still in the middle of the pandemic, the effect that it had on me was that I um, really dove into self-care as well but in ways that I felt guilty about prior to the pandemic because of the time and the dedication that it took to implement those things in my life. So Yvette and I, when we talked about uh, meditation the other day, I am a regular meditator, but there were just days, you know, in, in every week where things just fall to the wayside, your systems kind of fall to the wayside and you don't get in the, the meditation in the morning and before bed and, you know, that you really aim to. So being forced to sit still in the middle of a pandemic allowed me to take the time to sleep, which I love and which I deprive myself of for, for too long. So out of that, for the past uh, few months that we've been active again, I have put, you know, a bedtime in place. I'm in bed at 9.30 every single night and I wake up at 5.20 and I write and I read. And these are things that I never gave myself the, the, the opportunity to, to put in place, even though the opportunity was there, I just wouldn't give it to myself. I didn't feel worthy of it. I felt like everything else was more important than me and, and what filled me up. And in just being a witness to a lot of the kind of world on fire uh, environment that we're in right now, on top of being in a pandemic, it really made me evaluate, you know, the value of my voice because I have spent time as an activist on the ground, you know, at the courthouse picketing and videotaping the police and, you know, going into the prisons and teaching poetry workshops and all that. But I 
am not doing that now. I am teaching middle schoolers. I'm an administrator. I am the mother to a nine-year-old. And I really sat down and I had to tell myself, you know, so what? That doesn't make what you have to say and what you're feeling any less valid. The, the, the words that I wasn't really um, giving value to came back to life for me. So I found the power of my, you know, in my words again. And before it was motivated by like, you know, anxiety and the pulse of the moment. But, you know, I looked at myself like, well, I'm not really in the moment. You know, I'm watching the moment. I'm watching those who are out there and, and who are in the streets. And, you know, I see that like that used to be me. And that's okay that it's not me right now. And I was able to go through a process where I was cool with that. And it allowed me to really, you know, get in bed with my poetry again and um, find the, the power again that uh, I thought was, you know, put out by adult life. Older adult life. Over 30 adult life. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, and yes. thank you, Yvette. I want to take a moment uh, uh, to, to say that, uh, you know, in this, this, this Zoom environment, you don't get to hear or feel in the, the audience uh, response, but uh, I'm looking at the chat, uh, and there is, uh, there is a lot of love and appreciation for the work that's been delivered here today uh, and for your words. So on behalf of all those people, thank you, and I am just so thrilled. I'm going to turn to the... Uh, Q&A and see if we have something in there. Uh, okay. Uh, we, oh, here's a good one. Uh, where can we find these amazing ladies and their work? <laughs> oh, you can get me on Eat Words. <laughs> <laughs> if everybody can get on Eat Words and download. <laughs> That's www.eatwords. Is it .net or .com? I forget. It's my website. Come on, Ari. Seriously. <laughs> well, download, download my latest work. That that's something old, new, borrowed in the blues. Uh, so I, I had a lot of fun doing that, and um, uh, you know, I I moved between. Um, free verse and poetic form and um, love doing bop poems uh, that requires a little singing in their poems. So I love doing all that. And my um, presence as a writer is so like scattered all over the place. And I think coming from uh, the spoken word part of my journey, you know, there's a lot of me on YouTube that I'm not in control of. Um, there's some uh, chat books that I self-published when I was traveling around and, you know, selling them out of my backpack to make extra money on top of my feature uh, pay. Um, but um, there will be an Eat Words List Straight project before the end of the year. Isn't that right, Ari? So um, November is the goal for that. And that will definitely be a place where I am, where my work can be found. And just um, contact me. I, I love when people reach out to me after they've uh, seen or heard me perform. And, um, you know, I, I have some things. I have some audio of much of my work. And usually I can, you know, put it up for download somewhere when someone requests it. So... Thank you, Liz. Uh, Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, you click Q&A at the bottom of the screen and type it in there. Uh, I have another question uh, uh, for you now, perhaps. Uh, uh, I mean, both of your voices are, 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 are so unique uh, and, and so powerful in their own ways. Uh, maybe you could share a little bit uh, with the audience about your creative process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'll go with that. Um, well, uh, my my I, I always like to call it my first art there's always a first art right <laughs> my first art is as a musician so um I, i'm a guitar player 
and, um, and jazz was my music. So uh, I was imagining that I would be the first Georgette Benson. That was my goal. So I, I performed, I, um, I, rec um, I did uh, studio work, I did um, um, local work in DC, and I also was a music teacher. That's how my husband and I met. We used to teach at the same music studio because my husband's a musician as well. So he's a jazz musician, plays vibraphone. So um, as, a, as a musician, I also was a composer, a songwriter. And in that space, um, after it became evident for me that mus music was not going to be where I ended up, I was really lost in my 20s. I was really lost. And poetry and writing just became a way that I made sense out of my experience. So um, reading poetry, writing poetry, I, I am greatly influenced by um, Lucille Clifton. So uh, I really wanted to tell stories and short poems. I, I just think she is the master of that. I uh, greatly influenced by uh, James Baldwin and his essays, his truth telling, and Audre Lorde and her essays and poetry. I like the fact that she could um, fluctuate between those two spaces. And also Marge Piercy is another one that's a storyteller. So all these poems and essays um, made me think, you know, how can I tell my story and my experience through verse? And so um, I was, you know, in a different type of career track, a, a, a corporate career track. So I was a, a, a banker by day <laughs> and a poet by night. And I did that for several years. And then I just hit a point where I said, I really need to shift that. So I became uh, a poet full time and, and, and was always a teaching artist, uh, uh, always uh, teaching poetry. And so that was the way my, my poetry and creative life unfolded. And one of the things I had to accept early on and I don't know how many people, I'm imagining a lot of folk here from the university. There, yeah, I went to school, I have a degree in education, my undergraduate degree, and then I have two, um, two graduate degrees in creative writing. And so one of the things that was really evident for me, um, I went back to school in my 40s to do the creative writing work, and it, it, creative writing graduate work. I, I realized that you know, people wanted to make my writing a hobby. Like people would tell me, oh, that's a nice hobby. <laughs> like it was, uh, it was like a something new. And I kept thinking, you know, this might not be my full-time gig, but this is not a hobby. Like if I don't write, I will die. <laughs> and, and so I really want to encourage people that, uh, that are in this space is don't think, don't trivialize your, your writing. Don't trivialize um, that, that this is something like you can't earn a living as a, as a creative. I mean, all those things are fallacies. There's lots of things. I like to think of my life as a portfolio of work, but the work that I do as a poet is what keeps me alive. Nice. I can, uh, I dig that. I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, my creative process has changed uh, so much over the years. I was always a writer. Um, my stepdad said, like, if I'd be standing, like, talking on the phone, whatever papers would be on the counter would just be full of words and drawings and, you know, whatever else I could write by the time I was done with my conversation. And I wrote poems. Uh, as a child, I still have like the first evidence of me writing a poem that was on a homemade Mother's Day card to my mom. And I think I was about eight years old uh, when I wrote that. And I really didn't know that poetry was going to be such a big part of my life or that writing in general would be a big part of my life because it was just something that I, that I always did. I was an, an avid reader as a child. And I wrote all the time. I love to make up stories all the time. Sometimes that was not a good thing. 
as a child, but I have lots of practice making up stories and, you know, creating a world that uh, entertained me. I was an only child for a long time. And that is uh, a lot of, you know, uh, that led to a lot of time spent just entertaining myself and creating, you know, a, a world around me that felt uh, fun and awesome. And I did that through my characters and, and writing stories. Um, poetry was more like a private thing in my journal, in my diary that I thought my mom couldn't access because there was a little lock on it this big. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she will never know about my crush on this boy. You know, it's just ridiculous. But that's where the poetry came in. I never shared it with anyone ever until I was about... Um, I don't know, maybe 18 and, and I was doing like the online chat, little poetry rooms and stuff. And then I was invited in Jacksonville to perform at an open mic that was at um, Nefertiti's Books and Gifts, which I don't think exists anymore. But I was invited to read one of my short stories um, because that is, you know, what I was doing. I was writing fiction and, and stuff. And so I said, oh, I'm just going to bring this poem and like pull it out my pocket, like, bam, you know, in case I'm brave enough to, to read a poem when the poetry section starts. So I'm up there and I'm like, and blah, 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 and blah, at the end. And then I'm like, but I also have this poem if you would like me to read it too, if I have time. And then I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. and then the crowd just goes wild. And I'm like, okay, this is it. I found it. I'm here. This is, this is my home now. I'm part of the poetry world, whether they like it or not. So I was often, you know, motivated just by raw emotion. It was like my, my diary, like now was just like, open like Pandora's box, like here comes everything at you world. And um, at some point, uh, I, I started dealing with things a little better emotionally. <laughs> and I felt like my uh, creative process just like had the brakes put on it because I wasn't, you know, just like gushing with, with all this uncontrollable emotion anymore. So I really learned to kind of um, tap into myself in a, in a different way and it actually has you know structure and organization and I still read a lot I read I'm often reading you know three four books at a time thanks to audible I'm always listening to a book and and um, I find so much inspiration in fiction in prose and a lot of times that is the spark between my uh, poetic inspiration is something that I'm reading and um like i said before i put a system in place where i wake up at the same time every day and i have my coffee and i write and i read or i make a list of you know publications i want to submit to but i dedicate time to my craft and to the process of you know being a, a, a disciplined writer because that you know to be a disciplined anything is a process and when yvette when you said about you know being a, a banker by day and a poet by night there was a long time you know where i was like a poet by day and just a damn fool by night you know i was like living that artist life you know i wake up at two o'clock in the afternoon and you know just you know i was hosting like four open mics i had a poetry radio show and i was just you know making it by the skin of my teeth with like mayonnaise and carrots in the refrigerator you know and i did that for many years where i refused to work for anybody else and if i was short on a bill i would just sign up with a tip agency and you know make a couple dollars and then right back on the road or you know just really living that life and so when that life changed when that lifestyle changed i thought the poet in me didn't have a life anymore but it's been really refreshing over the years to just you know find again and again that you know poetry is something in me that will forever be in me and it and it doesn't you know it can be a, a, a beautiful controlled thing and and uh still be worthwhile you know for me personally and for um my audience so thank you liz thank yes. you Lizette. Mm -hmm. next question uh, mm -hmm. uh what's the role of audience in your work of readers and respondents uh, and your relationship to audience, real or imagined? Mm. Um, this is such a great question. Actually, Liz and I, we were talking with each other about the types of poets we are. And even <laughs> as a musician, I was like this. You know, I wanted to be a studio musician. You know, I wasn't into like being on stage and all that kind of stuff, all, especially at the time. I grew up in the 70s. So, you know, I mean, I did perform live. 
but my my aspiration was like hey let me back up some you know some great musicians you know that was what i wanted to do and so for me i i don't consider myself a performance poet like i don't i don't invest in trying to memorize my work and to get you know to get out there and 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 um and and um kind of really focus on a performance but what i am is a storyteller so that's how I see myself. And so storytelling in itself has a performance aspect to it. And that's the way I like to write. So I'm really uh, mindful around how I punctuate myself on the page. And um, I put notes on my sheets around how I want to pause when I read, um, take the breaths to make emphasis. And when I'm in, on the stage and, I, and I'm in front of an audience, and I see the head nods and the, and the eye contact. I know I'm reaching. I'm reaching. Um, I, I did I did a um, event at Yellow House um, Art, and I, I can't remember um, what the theme was, but I I had one of the essays that'll be in my book, and um, Black Joy uh, Black Joy in the Revolution, and um, it's, it's called Hair, and it just talked about these different things. Um, they were vignettes, if you will, about um, my life over time and my hair and just living life as a black woman in hair. And I can remember, I mean, the house was packed and I can remember looking up and uh, this white man in the back of the room, he raised up, he goes, I, I am just profoundly impacted by how you had to navigate the world and how much the hair mattered. Like he, he just couldn't get past that. And then he got me in a corner somewhere and just really needed to talk to me about <laughs> this thing, you know, like it was like, it had just revolutionized his mind around what black women go through in their hair. And so for me, audience is important because, you know, I, I know that if I can tell my story deeply, I'm reaching someone else. So, um, that's why I even tested out my my new thing, you know, Black Joy Always Lives in the Revolution is the opening part of my book. And I'm thinking, you know, hey, I'm just going to, you know, I know this needs a lot of work, but I'm just going to read it and just see how the audience hears it. So that's important for me to always just um, experiment in that way. Nice. I, you know, my, my relationship to audience, um, has come a long way. I always did things like piano recitals and, you know, as a child, I, I have moments on stage and I think when poetry kind of uh, kicked off for me, I was not ready for people, um, you know, taking in and, and having something to say <laughs> about my deeply emotional creations, you know. I can remember one time performing and uh, after the performance, a man came up to me and he said, you know, you are so good at what you do, but do you have to cuss so much? It's really not becoming of a woman and you should probably consider how other people see you and, you know, perceive you when you use uh, language like that. And then I don't remember the exact details, but then I just showed off of how much cussing I could do. And I just remember feeling so offended and just needing to defend, you know, my voice and what I had to say and how I wanted to say it. And, and that's always been a, a, a battle for me is just uh, being aware that there are people in the audience that um, will have something to say, like, it's almost like I want to read my poetry and then put my fingers in my ear, you know? So um, I've grown to really appreciate the uh, response, like you said, the visual response and the um, audible response when performing uh, in front of crowds, because in the moment, uh, it, I've never had an experience in the moment where someone said something that they didn't like about my work. It's usually after, I mean, 
usually they don't interrupt you on stage and be like, that's stupid. <laughs> you know? So like after I can kind of control and prepare myself. So I've learned that in the moment, most of the feedback and the response is going to be uh, positive or people that are really feeling what you have to say. So I've learned that my relationship with the audience, you know, it takes a lot of balancing um, for me. And I have met some of the best people in my life over the years uh, that, you know, that have been in the audience at a, at a poetry reading that I've done. So I, I, it's like, I love it and I, and I don't love it sometimes, but I, I realize that um, no matter what I think about my poetry, it, it means something uh, different to every person that hears it, you know? So it, it's thinking about the audience has actually allowed me to not be so critical of myself or say, oh man, that poem is so old and I read that all the time. It's like, so what? You know, you don't know who needs to hear it at that moment. And, you know, keeping the audience in mind reminds me that, you know, it's not about me, it's about the work and it's about what the poem has to say, not what Liz Strait has to say. So I, I, I do appreciate my relationship to um, the audience very much, whether it's, you know, things that I, publish and writing or actually being on the stage and performing my work. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Yvette. Yeah, I have more questions here for you, uh, but we're running, uh, uh, do we, we have time for, uh, uh, for one more? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, one more. Uh, what does community support for its artists, writers, creators look like to you? Uh, hmm. Not what it necessarily is, but what it could and should be. Oh, I can give this one the quick, the quick response. Um, um, I've been talking a lot on, um, in different forms, virtual forms. You know, I've been doing a lot of speaking engagements. And I've been talking about um, mothering our octopus gardens. That's been kind of like the key, the key phrase I've been using and the key message. And that's about um, black women, art making, um, activism and radical self care. And for me, a support from community means to create spaces where that can live out loud. I would like to see um, more housed spaces for art arts um, residencies. Um, <laughs> um, and think about black women who are usually holding down two jobs or a single family household or whatever. This is a space of getting a way to create, like give me, uh, for me, I need two or three weeks, but you know, give me a week or two weeks where I could be in a space where my job is to create and it costs me nothing to go there and that I have my basic life things, you know, taken care of, you know, I, 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 without a week of work, you know, I still won't be able to, you know, have food paid for, my electricity, my phone bill, whatever. Like, I just want that space to really go deep and, and create because for a lot of us we're we, we don't have the uh, fortunate um, uh, jobs or situations where we could do a sabbatical or that we can um, even have a work it so that we maybe work nine months but we have enough pay to ca to carry us over to twelve. That's not a, a lot of folks' reality who are creators, and and so I would like to see that kind of space in the community and and people will have joy providing that space. Yeah, pay me. That's the answer. That's my two word <laughs> short answer. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna ditto that. I'm gonna ditto. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, uh, thank you. I want to thank, once again, I want to thank uh, some terrific colleagues, True Leverett, Laura Heffernan, uh, Keith Cartwright for making this all possible. I want to thank uh, uh, Liz Strait, uh, Yvette Angelique for being here. You are, you are astounding. Uh, I want to thank the audience for being here because the moment this goes on the internet, this becomes public art and it is not hey. complete without the public. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, and uh, be well, stay safe, uh, wear a mask, vote. Thanks, Ari. Thank you, Ari.